This is Duke University. All right, hello everybody. Uh, I want to welcome you guys all back from lunch. Thanks for coming back to join us. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure today to uh, introduce Chris O'Connell, Executive VP uh, and Group President for the Restorative Therapies Group at Medtronic. Uh, I spent the summer at Medtronic, and uh, for me, Chris was the personification of uh, what was possible in a career uh, at Medtronic. Uh, after graduating from Harvard Business School in 94, uh, he quickly uh, rose to the ranks of Vice President of uh, sales and marketing for the Cardiac Rhythm Disease Management Group at Medtronic, uh, where he spent, uh, where he was positioned from 2001 to 2005. Uh, he spent a year as president of Medtronic's Emergency Response Systems Group, uh, and then jumped uh, in 2006 uh, to president, or senior vice president and president of Medtronic Diabetes. And I know he'll touch on a lot of that experience here today. Uh, he spent three years, and then since August uh, 2009, uh, he's been the executive vice president and group president for restorative therapies uh, with responsibilities for the spinal and biologics disease group, uh, surgical uh, technologies, neuromodulation, and diabetes, uh, where he provides strategic oversight for that group and uh, integration for the strategy and activities of that group into the one Medtronic uh, company um, uh, strategy. So... Um, Without further ado, I don't want to take up too much time. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Chris O'Connell. Great. Well, thank you very much. And oh, I should probably turn my mic on. I was instructed. I've already failed. Thanks to Duke here. Hello. Can you hear me better? That's better. Yeah. Okay. The Harvard guy will catch up here at Duke. Okay. Uh, anyway, um, thank you for having me. I really appreciate the invitation, and I just can't tell you how impressed I am with everything here at Duke, and especially um, the program uh, here with Dr. Schulman has uh, created. And uh, to have such a focus on the health sciences really makes the Duke University program stick out. And Medtronic has actually, I think as many of you know, um, had a long-standing relationship with Duke University in many, many regards, um, all the way up to the chairman of our company, my boss, Bill Hawkins. Um, who is a graduate of Duke, um, undergrad, grew up here in Durham, and continues to be very active here in the Duke community. And um, it's fun for us to see our relationship grow, for, for us to see more Fuqua uh, students come into the Duke, uh, into the Medtronic world, and, and to try to contribute also to your, your education um, through, um, through meetings like this. So I'm delighted to be here. I've been here actually a few days. Um, spent yesterday and today with uh, some of the surgeons over at the um, health center, the medical center, uh, in the neuro and the spine area, a good chance to catch up with some people, and um, also had a chance to sit down with uh, Dr. Victor Zhao, who, um, as the uh, chancellor, is also um, also a board member of Medtronic. So I get to see him on a on a regular basis. Um, I uh, I'm particularly pleased to be able to have this dialogue, and especially with you. Um, I have a particular interest in really what you're going through as uh, students here in the business school and in the other health management programs. Um, in, because as uh, Garrett said, I actually started my career at Medtronic as a uh, MBA student, and I was a little bit of a pioneer in that regard because at the time Medtronic was just getting going in terms of hiring uh, MBAs, and I was in one of those first classes. Um, the dirty little secret is I actually applied for a summer internship and got denied by Medtronic, so it just shows that persistence pays off because the next year I applied for a full-time job after graduation and they accepted me. So. Um, you know, Medtronic is patient, I was patient, and it worked out okay, because uh, 16 and a half years later, I'm still with the company, and, and I can just tell you, I, I feel more strongly than ever um, that uh, the best years for our company are ahead of us, uh, given everything going on in medicine, um, and that I uh, truly, you know, have an ability to contribute to, to what we're trying to accomplish as a company. Um, so I've been asked to come talk today about uh, medical devices uh, in the world of diabetes and metabolic disease, and it's a very interesting topic because Medical devices, you might ask, um, you know, what is truly the role in these disease states? In some cases, it's obvious. In other cases, it's less obvious. And even to us, it's less obvious. And so I, I will try to get through my presentation reasonably quickly, but I'd love to then throw it open uh, for some discussion, some Q&A, because I genuinely feel that I have 
more to learn from you than you do from me, and hopefully the rest of the conference has come up with some ideas that I could take back to Medtronic, because Medtronic is the leader in medical devices worldwide, and we want to be at the forefront of whatever technology development uh, is happening in some of these very important disease areas. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Medtronic, a little bit about metabolic disease and diabetes, but try to spend most of my comments talking about some different applications, both inside Medtronic and some things I see out there that are interesting, provocative, um, and then some questions. And then we'll open it up um, to Q&A. And so I'm going to test if this works. Okay. Um, Medtronic is now in its 61st year as a company. It was, uh, like many companies, started in a garage by a guy named Earl Bakken, who was an electrical engineer at the University of Minnesota. Um, Earl Bakken went on to uh, create the first wearable cardiac pacemaker back in 1957, um, which is the second device pictured here today, and over time really grew up as a cardiac pacing company. Um, for many, many years, really for the first three, four decades of the company's existence, that's all the, com that's all the company did. And like many high-tech startups, the company had its trials and travails and, and you know, endured through many uh, difficult moments um, where it went out of business several times and restarted and um, you know, was heroically saved and then just continued to develop. But clearly, it's been a te medical technology company that is, at its core, uh, very integrated with the clinical community with which we, in which we serve. Um, in fact, that first cardiac pacemaker, wearable cardiac pacemaker, was created as really a joint effort between a surgeon, Dr. C. Walt Lillehei, who was a famous cardiothoracic surgeon at the University of Minnesota, um, when he had a, a, a need uh, to help treat patients more effectively after uh, pediatric open heart surgery to, uh, to repair ventricular septal defects. Um, and Bakken created the tool that then Lillehei used to help uh, bridge patients to recovery. And so it's that collaboration between the clinical community and the, and the technical community really that has spawned so much innovation in medical technology and at Medtronic. Um, we've grown up over that time and today we have six major product categories. We have that cardiac rhythm management or the heart rhythm management area which is the original pacemaker defibrillator part of the company. Um, we, the second biggest business at Medtronic is the spinal and biologics business which is under my responsibility. Um, and that came to us through an acquisition of a company called Sophomore Danic in Memphis, Tennessee, back in about 1999. Um, we also have a cardiovascular division, which makes um, every, uh, all the equipment used in both um, bypass surgery in terms of structural heart products like heart valves, prosthetic heart valves, cardiopulmonary equipment, but also interventional cardiology equipment, coronary stents, and all the uh, devices used to treat uh, percutaneous coronary and, and peripheral interventions. Um, we also have a diabetes business, again, an acquisition of a company about 10 years ago called Minimed, which makes the insulin pump as well as the continuous glucose uh, monitoring system. And that's a business that I had the opportunity to manage uh, before um, my current position. Um, also, another business I'm responsible for is the neurological business, which actually adapted some of that original pacemaker technology, pulse generation technology, to um, provide stimulation for pain management um, by stimulating the spinal cord. Um, but also doing deep brain um, implants of electrodes uh, to literally melt away the symptoms of Parkinson's disease and essential tremor and other types of dyskinesias and dystonia uh, type diseases. In fact, I was just meeting yesterday with uh, Dr. Dennis Turner over at the, uh, over at the uh, medical center who is one of the world experts in um, deep brain stimulation and the uh, chief of neurology, um, Dr. Stacy, is one of the great movement disorder doctors and they uh, both have an opportunity to uh, participate in, in this field with us. Um, our last division is surgical technologies, also under my responsibility, which makes everything from ear, nose, throat equipment to um, large capital uh, for um, imaging and navigation. You can see a picture of the O-arm there, which is the world's only 3D interoperative uh, CT machine. It's a, a breakthrough technology that allows image-guided surgery for spine surgery and neurosurgery. Um, so it's a company that's grown up quite a bit. Um, now the number one player in nine out of the 11 major product categories that we serve. Um, the impact of the company is very broad, and um, if I can click through here, maybe not. Okay. Um, is there a computer here I can just, there we go. There we go, maybe I'll stand right here at the podium. Um, I mentioned the 60 years of the company uh, Medtronic now has 40,000 people around the world in 120 different countries uh, that we do business. Um, we treat more than 50 discrete disease states, uh, which makes us the broadest medical technology company in the world. Um, we have over 150,000 products, 
And probably the most important statistic of all at Medtronic is the fact that we serve 7 million people annually across all of our therapeutic lines. And we actually have a goal now that by the year 2020, we want to grow that to 25 million people per year by the year 2020. And that's going to be very much driven um, by our global growth strategy to, um, to enter uh, markets and help develop healthcare markets around the world, especially in the emerging economies. Um, we spend more than a, a billion and a half annually on R&D and have over 21,000 patents in the company. It's a very engineering-oriented company. Um, we do 16 billion now in annual revenue and over the past five years have produced over 14 billion in free cash flow. So a very strong, healthy company that's very uh, invested in R&D and research um, and also the highest levels of support and service for our clinical customers. I keep trying to go back to this thing, but it's not working very well, so stay here. Um, okay, so looking forward and maybe as a, as a bridge over to the chronic disease uh, topic, um, you know, I'm sure you've heard a lot today about chronic disease management, and, and the, the statistics are staggering, where um, healthcare spending is increasingly becoming dominated by spending on chronic disease care. Um, and in fact, um, within a pretty short period of time, three quarters of the deaths all over the world will actually be as a result of chronic disease. Probably the most troubling statistic, especially for the emerging economies, is the fact that um, half of the global deaths occur in the age group of 30 to 50, which is you know, when people are generally their most, genuinely their most productive uh, to society and to the economy. In fact, the, uh, the loss in productivity, um, we, the, there have been studies that show the loss of productivity of an early death in this age is four to five times the cost of the intervention that could have been provided to save that life. Um, so clearly there's a role in all these major debilitating disease states, all of which Medtronic covers through its products. And probably the most sobering of all is that here in the United States, half of the population within 20 years will have some form of a chronic disease. Um, so talking a little bit about the diabetes and uh, the metabolic diseases, obviously I don't have to say too much about the absolute global pandemic that diabetes is for the world today. It's the most, fa it's the most fastest growing disease, major disease. In fact, experts believe that one of three people born today in the U.S. will develop diabetes over their lifetime. Um, it is the only major disease state where the death rate is actually rising um, right now and obviously has devastating effects. Um, some of the emerging economies like India and China actually have a bigger problem than even the United States actually having more um, people with diabetes and metabolic disease. In fact, I was recently in China where some people estimate that upwards of 100 million people in China have diabetes or metabolic disease already. Uh, today, and it's not even the future that everybody uh, talks about. Um, obviously, the costs of treating diabetes to the healthcare system are, are profound, and uh, the system, as you've talked about uh, earlier today, is not very well set up for, um, for those treatments. Um, just a quick note on diabetes, there are two types of diabetes. I'm going to talk more about type 2 diabetes today, but Medtronic is very much in the business of treating type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease um, that often strikes earlier in life um, that uh, renders the pancreas completely unable to produce uh, adequate insulin to meet the metabolic needs of the body. Um, and so patients who are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes um, go uh, onto insulin therapy very quickly, either onto shots or ultimately progressing to a pump. But type 2 diabetes is, um, you know, 10 times the size. Obviously, it's the diabetes you tend to read more about on the front page of the uh, newspaper. In fact, if you picked up the USA Today, there was an article about obesity in, in in children and what that portends in terms of their development into adults. Um, but type 2 diabetes is a metabolic disease where the body doesn't make uh, enough insulin or properly utilize it. And obviously in the early stages, diet, exercise, and oral medication is the, uh, is the proper treatment. But over time, type 2 diabetes can very much become insulin requiring. And in, in its most um, advanced state can actually look a lot more like type 1 diabetes in terms of very unstable glucose patterns. Um, and metabolic syndrome, more, more widely known, uh, obviously there are many experts today uh, talked about this, so I won't dwell on, on the problem that is metabolic syndrome, but obviously the body, uh, the human body over time has de developed adaptive um, mechanisms where it uh, stores food as energy for use um, in exercise. But as you can see from our friend on the couch and our friend getting a little exercise walking his dog there, um, there is often an imbalance between the energy uh, consumed through food 
and the um, requirement of uh, the physical energy required, uh, which leads to obviously devastating health impacts. Um, it's not just a lifestyle of the disease, though, as the previous panel was discussing. Um, there are very much some genetic underpinnings um, to metabolic syndrome, um, but there's certainly a lot we can do about it and we need to do about it as a society. Um, obviously, the definition of metabolic syndrome is pretty straightforward. It's uh, elevated fasting glucose before you get to the diabetes level. It's uh, what we call adiposity or the uh, waist circumference, the abdominal obesity around the waist. It's uh, high blood pressure, um, low uh, HDL or the good cholesterol, and obviously high triglycerides is how you actually define metabolic syndrome. And it's, it's actually very easy to find. It's very easy to measure. Um, it's just very difficult to treat. Um, it's also well documented that, um, that there is higher mortality uh, among the uh, metabolic syndrome population, uh, more than two times uh, all-cause mortality. Uh, this is in a study uh, from JAMA um, in, uh, Nor I think, uh, Finland of 1,000 middle-aged men. Um, and by the way, it also factored out the effect of diabetes and, uh, and the trend lines didn't, didn't change. But um, two times the rate of all-cause mortality and more than three times the rate of cardiovascular disease and coronary heart disease, almost four times. Um, so obviously, uh, early death is very much predicted by metabolic disease, um, if not properly managed. Um, and there has been some progress, but still a lot of challenge and disappointment. Um, mortality rates for coronary heart disease have actually been dropping um, in the developed markets around the world. I think this is a U.S. data uh, population uh, in terms of deaths per, um, per million patients um, in the U.S. and in some other developed markets. And so there have been a lot of innovations in the um, in the coronary heart disease death um, area, um, whether it's statins, a lot of the great medications, um, even uh, better choices people are making, even some devices. Um, but we are a long way off from, from being good. Um, it's pretty shocking when you look at a map of the United States and look at uh, obesity and diabetes. Back in 1994, it's interesting, I found this chart because that was the year I started with Medtronic. Um, there wasn't a single state in the United States that had more than a quarter of their population with obesity or more than 10% uh, with diabetes. But if you fast forward just uh, 14 um, fast years, the map looks entirely different. Um, where half the states in the United States have a obese population um, of uh, greater than 25% and a quarter of the states in the United States have a uh, diabetes population of more than, uh, more than 10%. Um, and these two are very, uh, very linked together. Um, the uh, majority of the type 2 diabetes cases are definitely related to obesity and to weight gain, and um, there's also an awareness problem. 85% of people with prediabetes or metabolic syndrome don't know that they actually have the condition. Um, the progression from uh, prediabetes all the way through is a little bit scary. There are probably 60 million people in the United States with prediabetes that uh, attempt to manage that through lifestyle and some medications, but um, uh, probably 20 million people today have type 2 diabetes, and um, and most of the people with prediabetes will develop into type 2 diabetes. Um, there's a number of paths from there that are, that are all bad, including insulin dependency, including chronic kidney disease, where, um, where, where there's a very direct linkage between type 2 diabetes and uh, new kidney uh, failure cases. And then, of course, uh, myocardial infarction or heart attack. 10% um, of diabetics actually have heart attack, and uh, a large number of um, uh, those die from... Um, uh, some sort of uh, cardiac disease or vessel disease. It's not just a U.S. problem, but obviously the metabolic disease problem is truly a global pandemic um, all around the world. Probably 500 million people today around the world uh, have some form of metabolic disease. Um, I thought the previous panel made a great point that it's a complex disease, and it's not, there's not a silver bullet, but um, just you know, as a closing comment on the overall disease, it is a very complex um, physiology and pathophysiology um, situation that, that is um, related to the hormonal systems of the body, the neural systems of the body, and also many psychological factors. Um, there is some short-term success um, that people have, um, and it's fairly common, but long-term success with obesity is, um, is uh, less, than, less than promising. Um, and in some cases, successful long-term outcomes require some fairly drastic procedures, which I'll, I'll touch on, um, which uh, can be very effective for the right patient. Um, but I think the, the one point I want to make more broadly, and this is a good challenge to all of you in the business community and the medical community, is you know, this, is, this is probably the area of medicine where there's the most innovation needed. Um, if I look at other areas of chronic disease management, if I look at diabetes 
if I look at cardiovascular disease, if I look at neurodegenerative diseases, there have been very successful marches of innovation through those diseases. And I think we're at the very beginning stage of obesity and, and, uh, and metabolic syndrome and, and type 2 diabetes. And I think that's really exciting. And it's, uh, you know, certainly companies like Medtronic or Eli Lilly, you know, have some plays in these areas, but um, this is gonna take a broader community of, of researchers, of uh, caregivers, of companies to all work together to provide the innovation that's needed. So I wanna shift gears now and just actually talk about some of those innovations um, and some of the things that, that are out there and then throw it open. But, um, you know, start with the point that medical innovation in, in chronic disease has obviously had a huge impact. And you can look at these numbers in the last two or three decades. Healthcare innovation in this country has, has produced some phenomenal results. Whoops, that's weird, I didn't touch anything and it went forward. <laughs> Maybe there's an automatic forward on that one. But um, a decline in mortality, decline in heart attacks, stroke, breast cancer, disability, hospital stays, um, many, many dollars uh, created through efficiency in the healthcare system and many more to go uh, through better prevention, detection, and management. Um, so I think there's a strong track record of medical technology playing a strong role in the chronic diseases, which actually makes us optimistic about um, the metabolic diseases. In fact, if you look all over the body today in the, in the major systems um, that we treat, everything from the neurological conditions I alluded to, to the cardiovascular system and, and even the musculoskeletal disease, that we treat through spine, um, implantable medical devices um, have uh, played a role in almost every one of these areas. These are chronic uh, implants for degenerative diseases, um, whether that's neurostimulation or cardiac stimulation, or whether that's structural uh, implants, or whether that's even drug infusion, drug delivery, either implantable or external. Uh, medical technology has come a long way in treating many of these diseases. A big part of that is the technology innovation. Let's. Uh, it really starts there. There's a lot of other innovation around these set of problems that we need to focus on, whether it's business model innovation, um, healthcare financing innovation, uh, all sorts of innovation is needed. But it all starts with technology innovation in terms of miniaturization. Oops, this is weird. Uh, min miniaturization, the, I'm gonna talk a little bit about sensing and diagnostics, uh, all sorts of new biomaterials, infusion technology, and uh, microelectronics and information technology, which I'll talk a little bit about as well. Um, if, if the past in this field was characterized by advances in the medical technology aspect, I think what's gonna really um, mark the next era of innovation in medical devices is actually the convergence of technologies between medical technology, information technology, and biotechnology. Um, I'm gonna talk a little more about the information technology piece, but um, we're very active at Medtronic in, across the board in everything from targeted drug delivery to innovations from the engineering sciences, and now seeing some of the integration that's possible by, um, by uh, creating sensors and smart devices and linking them to information networks that can help provide better care. Um, we often use the word the all body network or body computing, but what, what Medtronic implants are often doing, as well as those of many other people in the industry, is they're collecting real time physiologic data at the point of capture and then we can actually leverage that data by networking it and providing it to people um, who can do something more effectively with it. Um, certainly leveraging uh, the advanced technology, we have a wafer fab facility at Medtronic. Um, we're able to produce very small miniature devices that have great computing ability. Um, the small device that looks like a seashell here is actually a wireless transmitter for a continuous glucose monitor sensor. If I just keep talking fast enough, the slides will click <laughs> for myself. I didn't plan it this way. <laughs> Um, but um, we've got this great new technology, for example, uh, that's applicable today to type 1 diabetes and in the future very much to all diabetes or unstable glucose patterns called continuous glucose monitoring. It's a tiny subcutaneous electrode that is worn for up to three days or six days and it captures glucose information um, by putting the sensor into the interstitial fluid that surrounds um, the, uh, the cells and the body tissue underneath the skin. Um, and the glucose information that's captured is then correlated to blood glucose measurements um, and adapted through a complex algorithm that allows this type of technology to really change the game completely from episodic blood glucose testing to continuous glucose monitoring. And I'll show you a picture of that because a picture's worth a thousand words. But in the, in the case of diabetes um, or even metabolic disease with bad glucose control, um, 
the whole game is about keeping people in a targeted range to keep stable blood sugars ideally as low as possible without increasing the risk of low blood sugar or hypoglycemia. And so you could actually look at the chart on the left here, um, which might come to you through episodic blood glucose testing and think that that patient is in good control. Well, the reality is when you test your blood sugar, you know what it is, but you have no idea which way it's going or more importantly, how fast it's going there. If you put a continuous glucose monitor on, then you might actually see much greater variability um, in and out of range, including dangerous highs and dangerous lows. And then if you actually then give that, uh, that continuous glucose monitoring device to a patient instead of just a diagnostic use by a physician, you can actually change therapy or change um, uh, a number of parameters, uh, patient management parameters, to actually stop those excursions. Um, it's one of the most revolutionary new technologies ever to hit medical devices. It's been, out for about, it's been around for about 10 years, and it's only beginning to um, take off as a major uh, therapeutic modality in, in diabetes, particularly intensively managed type 1 diabetes. Um, we've obviously linked that continuous glucose monitoring uh, technology with our uh, insulin infusion device, which is a uh, insulin pump, continuous insulin pump. And obviously, the, um, the great dream of the company is to close the loop and provide an adaptive system that continuously measures glucose and then changes insulin delivery and even potentially the delivery of other, um, of other compounds, maybe like glucagon, um, to actually create a closed loop system or an artificial pancreas, if you will. This has long been the dream of, of Minimed and now Medtronic. We've been building the, the foundational technologies over time. Um, and now, for the first time ever, we have an adaptive system on the market commercially outside the United States um, called VEO, which actually has a feature called low glucose suspend. So if a patient is going dangerously low um, and is not reacting to that, the device will automatically suspend insulin delivery because the last thing you want to do is deliver insulin to a low. Um, and, uh, rescue the patient. It's been phenomenally successful. Unfortunately, our FDA uh, here in the United States is, is uh, getting increasingly cautious and um, is actually requiring very lengthy clinical trials uh, to approve what's really a safety feature in a device. And so Americans will not benefit from this technology probably for two to three years, um, while other people around the world benefit right away. But that's all part of becoming a more a global company. Um, but I want to talk about managing diabetes uh, even beyond just an intensive therapy for the most demanding patients uh, to go beyond closing the loop and actually talk about expanding the loop. Um, the great thing about um, what's going on in the technology world is we can now meld the medical technologies with all the great things that are happening in information technology today, whether it's cellular uh, connectivity, um, the whole cloud server world, um, consumer devices, and then obviously trying to create a, a, a completely linked patient network. Um, and the result of that is going to be able to, be, to move some of the chronic management and even patient management from a manual tracking, a very labor-intensive, very inefficient system for healthcare to something that's more interactive, more real-time, and more remote. Um, and that's exactly what Medtronic is working on today and ultimately creating a system. Um, and we have a BlackBerry and an, iP an iPod device um, under development where parents can remotely manage and monitor the changing glucose pa uh, um, patterns of their uh, children or of other loved ones and even have uh, direct linkages to the, uh, to the care system um, that uh, people with diabetes interact with in terms of diabetes educators and even emergency personnel if needed. Um, so this is a great new technology. It's, it's very uh, high tech. Um, it, it, it works well, especially as we continue to improve the continuous glucose monitoring technology. But we call this mobile health solutions. And we're doing it not just in diabetes, but in a range of other areas of Medtronic. But it's particularly important um, for, for diabetes. Um, and today, type 1 and in the future, type 2. Um, it means empowerment for the patient. It means better compliance and efficiency for the healthcare uh, provider. And we think for the healthcare system, um, actually better overall cost and value. Um, clearly, a lot of people look at technology and technology like this as part of the problem. Um, where I think actually the opposite is true, that technology is actually part of the solution in creating a more efficient and effective healthcare system. So let me uh, shift to obesity, and clearly this is the next great frontier for devices. Obviously, I don't have to talk about the great costs to uh, the healthcare system in terms of um, you know, the, care, the, the care that's required for obesity and the annual patient spend, but it's obviously very oriented today towards surgery, 
and uh, not very much in the device world. But the market is so big that every 1% of market penetration with, say, a $5,000 medical device is an individual market of 800 million or more. Um, it's an extraordinary opportunity, and fix this I'm about to be fixed. Wow. Well, we've got you halfway. Through. Okay, that's good. Wow, I could never have done that. I don't know what he did, but it worked. Anyway, but it's, a, uh, it's an extraordinary opportunity for whoever figures out a way to innovate in this space. Um, a big part of treating type 2 diabetes uh, and obesity is dietary restriction. And today there's a number of good alternatives for dietary restriction, including gastric bypass, a gastric banding, which is really a very fast growing business, um, and a newer area called intragastric balloons, where uh, balloons are literally um, created for, um, for the stomach uh, to help reduce uh, the cavity and improve the dietary restriction concept. Um, and really, ga gastric bypass is the gold standard today. Um, I'm not an expert in this area. Medtronic is not really involved in this area, so I'll just make a few comments. Um, but the results um, are, are, are good. Um, for the right patient, up to a 60% um, reduction in excess weight loss, which is kind of the metric that um, gastric surgeons uh, look at, um, with a very good success rate of comorbidity resolution and relatively low mortality. That being said, um, it's a surgery that doesn't necessarily meet all the patient needs and certainly um, the patient needs of a wider population. It's very invasive. It's, um, it's ablative um, in terms of destroying anatomy. There, there are side effects and there are dietary restrictions and of course it's not uh, reversible. And so the unmet need in this area, um, I, ta I, I think about as therapies that you know, can really make a meaningful difference in excess weight loss, can resolve some of the comorbidities um, uh, just like um, the surgery can, although maybe more of them, and are less invasive. Um, we're all searching for less invasive procedures. Really, that's been the history of medical technology, is to first solve the problem, then become more efficient and effective at it uh, through less invasive means. Um, in addition to the therapies that are out there today of diet and exercise, oral medication, gastric banding, and gastric bypass, there's a number of investigational concepts underway um, in this country and around the world as well. Um, in terms of, the, I mentioned the balloons, but um, there's also uh, injectables, there's gastric sleeves and stents that are being developed, which are very um, promising. And um, even Medtronic has a little bit of a play in this um, by adapting some of our neurostimulation um, to gastric stimulation. We've had a number of trials over the years uh, looking at the right way to pace the stomach, if you will, um, to try to treat this area. Uh, the great thing about pacing, um, very much like the brain or the heart, is that it's non-destructive. Um, so for example, in neuro, where, um, say, for some types of movement disorders, a surgeon would perform a thalamotomy or a pallidotomy and actually remove portion of the brain that was causing the, um, the movement disorder, we can now electrically stimulate and not destroy any tissue in a completely reversible procedure. That similar principle um, is one that we would like to see happen through gastric stimulation, and we're in very, very early stages and really the trial and error period of, um, of trying to make that work. I wanted to, though, also touch on a another really interesting one that, that I've come across, and, and this is in this category of a really novel approach, and this is one that many people don't know about. It's called, there's a little company called Scientific Intake, and they have something called the Smart Device, which is actually very clever in saying, let's move the concept of dietary restriction from the gut to the point of food entry. And there is a, um, I'm not very familiar with this area, but there's a, there's a disorder called Taurus uh, palatinus, where there's sort of an overgrowth of the palate, which actually reduces the size of the cavity in the mouth and actually um, puts a person in a position where they just can't eat very much very fast. And there's a lot of research around the fact that um, the problem with overeating is the speed of eating. And this device, which looks like a little retainer and is custom made for the patient and very cheap, is it can actually be placed in the mouth at mealtime and it restricts the size of the mouth cavity by 30% without actually changing any of the taste, um, your ability to taste food or enjoy food. And so it slows you down dramatically and you eat less and there's some early clinical evidence um, that this significantly reduces both food intake, caloric intake as well um, as weight and it's sustainable. It also has a sensor in it and that sensor um, communicates to a network um, that sends information about patient compliance with the device 
in daily progress um, in terms of food volume through. Again, it's kind of a, kind of a crazy idea, but it's actually very clever. Um, and there are some people who've used it um, with great success, again, trying to move dietary restriction from the gut, which is a pretty challenging environment to do it in, just to simply the, uh, uh, the food intake area. Um, and that's, um, you know, that's one example of innovation that's happening out there. This is a very small company that's in early stage, um, but you know, I had never even heard of this about two or three months ago. And hopefully there's a lot of other concepts out there that people are working on in the device world that have very simple, intuitive, safe, and affordable uh, devices that can help um, in terms of the um, dietary restriction process. Um, I, it would, I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention lifestyle management, because it's not just all about devices. Um, one example of a program that, that is a very intensive program for intervention, um, lifestyle intervention, is called VLM, or Virtual Lifestyle Management. It's a program that is, um, that is part of the NIH uh, DPP uh, program, and it engages patients for an entire year in 16 very intensive weekly and eight monthly lessons um, with a broad range of support in terms of information technology, in terms of education and intervention, coaching, uh, et cetera, and really um, is designed to change behavior um, on a permanent basis. Um, there's a little company out in California called DPS that is, um, that is marketing this program. And um, when you look at the lessons on a weekly and a monthly basis, there are things that just make a lot of sense in terms of the education process, um, in terms of strategies and actions to, uh, to both jumpstart behavior change, but also to sustain it. Um, and then even some life coping skills and time management and cooking and, and other, other uh, you know, just other topics that all go together. Uh, clearly managing obesity, managing metabolic disease is a very complex process that requires really a village, if you will, and um, a comprehensive approach. And it's, uh, it's, it's an approach that, in this case, has been very effective. And this is just a couple of screenshots uh, for the online tracking tools where patients can um, follow their progress very, very closely and, and measure their results and, and get that immediate feedback loop um, from the activities they're engaging in. But um, there, was a, there was some data published um, where 12 months after enrollment, um, there was significant weight loss um, among those actively engaged with the program and that that weight loss had been sustained over a number of months uh, following the VLM interaction. Now, I know there's a lot of other disease management programs out there, some of which are very, very successful. And I'm not suggesting this is the one that's kind of the winner because there's a lot of different flavors of this. But I'm, I'm giving this example to point out the fact that there's not a silver bullet in terms of devices. There's not just some device out there that we're going to create that's going to solve this problem. Um, this takes interaction on the part of the, the family, the caregivers, the individual, um, and the healthcare system. And, um, and that's, uh, this is one example of, of really closing that loop. Um, so really, in summary, um, you know, it's obviously not hard to understand just the, the global pandemic we're facing um, as a world in terms of metabolic disease and diabetes. Um, and obviously, the consequences of this disease, if not managed correctly, are devastating, uh, both to the individuals, to the families, but also, as I pointed out earlier, in terms of loss of productivity to society, uh, to economies. Um, I mean, you look at uh, an example of um, premature death um, from whatever, uh, whatever disease, uh, look, at the, look at Russia, which has a fairly low um, uh, fairly early death rate. And um, economists have observed that, um, that you know, making, a, making, an, making an indent in terms of the uh, mortality rates could actually make um, significant improvements in the overall performance of that economy and growth of that economy. Um, so this is uh, devastating to everybody. Um, we do have an urgent need. There are not a lot of good answers, but, um, but it's both therapeutic approaches as well as patient management approaches. And as I've alluded to a few times, everybody um, in the system has a role to play here. Um, this is not a silver bullet on the part of the medical device industry or the pharmaceutical industry, um, but it's, it's going to ultimately require partnership and novel ideas and innovation um, from every, every participant in the healthcare system. Um, but I think that if we, you know, apply the type of success we've had in innovation um, in the industry and so many other chronic degenerative diseases, that obesity and metabolic disease should not ultimately be a, um, you know, a uh, too big of a barrier to overcome. Um, and just a final word, um, you know, Medtronic is uh, obviously involved in some of these activities. 
Um, we're not involved in, in every aspect of it. We're looking to be more involved. We actually created an obesity venture uh, in our corporate organization that's managing that gastric stimulation program uh, that I mentioned and is, is also interfacing with some of these other companies like the one I alluded to um, that are developing novel therapies. Um, you know, we, we continue to look outside the company and inside the company uh, for innovation and we want to play a role. Um, Medtronic is a company that has been around a long time and is going to be around a long time uh, from now because of the innovation, innovative spirit but also because of the fundamental mission we pursue. Um, this is actually a picture of Earl Bakken, the founder of Medtronic, who I, uh, I mentioned earlier at the very beginning of the presentation. He's now 85 years old. Um, he lives in Hawaii. He created the world's first cardiac wearable cardiac pacemaker, and today he actually has an implantable cardiac pacemaker inside him. He also has three coronary stents from Medtronic, and as you can see from the picture with the young Compton boys, he, is the, he has type 2 diabetes and is the proud wearer of the Medtronic um, Minimed Paradigm Insulin Pump and Continuous Glucose Monitoring System. So he keeps his diabetes well under control. He's proud to say that he has a um, hemoglobin A1C, which is an average blood sugar of 5.5, which is extraordinarily low, um, especially for somebody with type 2 diabetes. Um, he's very well managed, but um, really this is, this is what Medtronic is all about. Um, we're not always perfect, um, but we play to win, and we play to win for one very important reason, and that's the benefit of the patients that we serve. That's what our mission is all about that Earl Bakken wrote more than 50 years ago to alleviate pain, restore health, and extend life. And um, you know, we're very confident that as we march into the future and face some of these very tough, tough medical problems like obesity and like metabolic syndrome and diabetes, that we can play a role. Um, so with that, I'm, I thank you for your, uh, your attention, and I'd love to open it up to Q&A at this point in time. Uh, thank you for your time, Chris. Um, I just had a question around emerging markets, understanding that there is a tremendous need there, and uh, uh, I wanted to understand how your product portfolio and the way you do R&D uh, differs today from maybe 15 years back when you were concentrating a lot on the U.S. market to come up with these low-cost devices uh, for these uh, emerging countries where diabetes and you know, other chronic states are very prevalent. Yeah, it's a terrific question. Thank you for it. And it's, it's a timely question because we've just made a major change in our organization and our approach to globalization that is going to attempt to answer the question you pose more effectively. Um, for many years, our innovation model was, um, you know, I would characterize it as, you know, my lab is the world here in the U.S. where we have U.S.-oriented businesses that create products for a developed market and then at some point try to export those products to the emerging markets. That strategy works for a period of time because clearly in countries like India, China, Brazil, there are populations of people who demand the, the, the highest uh, technology, the most sophisticated products. There's large, um, wealthy populations. Um, and so you can think you're doing well in China and India and places like this for a period of time with that model. Um, we've done a lot of soul searching. We've continued to bump and bruise ourselves and develop as a global company. And so we've actually recently taken a page out of Pharma's playbook and reorganized the company um, in, from a mindset of U.S. and international to developed markets and emerging markets. We've totally turned it. And so, you know, we used to have an international division um, that would sort of coordinate activities outside the U.S. for all of our business units. But, um, um, you know, the reality is markets like Germany, Italy, Canada, and Australia are a lot more like the U.S., than they are India, China, Brazil, Russia, right? Um, and so we've now grouped all of the developed markets together to try to create more commonality among the way we approach those because largely patient needs, healthcare systems are mature, um, patient needs are the same, and, and we can have a cohesive strategy. But what we've also done at the same time is taken the emerging markets and created independent business units in, in, the, in the big four of uh, China, India, Brazil and uh, Russia, and then to a lesser extent, Mexico and Turkey. And we've given the general managers of those countries full autonomy in, in their own P&L. And so now we're starting to set up R&D locally in those markets to try to create products that are more, more relevant to larger populations in those markets. Um, 
For example, we entered a joint venture a few years ago with a Chinese orthopedic company called Weigao, um, where we're producing the premium spine implant products and importing them. They're producing some value and spine implant products through a joint R&D effort in China. And then we're di uh, distributing those products through two different distribution channels. Um, that's an example of what we're doing, and we're going to be doing a lot more of it going forward. So we're trying to go from model of, you know, my lab is the world, if you're an engineer sitting there in Minnesota, to the world is my lab. And we'll do innovation, we'll do R&D anywhere in the world closer to the customer need. And I think the, the, the real benefit that's going to come downstream when we develop more innovative, more, less ex expensive um, technologies, and we can actually import those maybe back into developed markets, um, as, as, as certainly developed markets struggle with, um, you know, with uh, creating access uh, for patient care to some of these technologies. Yes, reserved. Uh, 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 thank you for uh, attractive presentation. Uh, regarding uh, innovation, I have a question. Uh, how do, do you watch or find, find uh, innovative knowledge or skills or items? And if you use uh, uh, extra source like uh, uh, university uh, finding or like that, uh, how do you segment uh, your internal source uh, for example, R and D division and uh, external items. So the question is around internal R and D versus external R and D. Yeah. Yes, um, it's a good question, and you know we're certainly we're certainly humble enough to uh, understand that you know we're we're not going to create all the innovation you know that, that we need in our, in our areas, and so the company has a long history of collaborating externally. Um, sometimes that comes through the form of acquisitions. Many of the product lines we mentioned, in fact. With, with the exception of the neuromodulation business, every single business I manage um, has been acquired at some point in time. And, um, uh, but we also acquire a lot of IP. We apply, uh, acquire early stage technology. And we have a network of partnerships with research universities around the world here, including Duke University, um, where, uh, you know, where, where we're continuously innovating. I mean, I, I would go back to what I said before, which is we're very different from pharmaceuticals in this sense. Um, in the pharmaceutical industry, there's, there can be a tremendous amount of innovation in the labs of the companies um, without necessarily the level of collaboration with the clinician um, that you see in medical technology. In medical devices, you know, it's, it's a clinical problem that a, that a doctor is trying to solve combined with the ingenuity of an engineer um, that can solve that problem with a tool. And in that sense, we're tool makers um, for clinicians. And that partnership has been true since the beginning with Bakken and is very much foundational to how we operate. So you could actually characterize innovation in Medtronic and in our industry as very external because there's very, very few products that we come up with on our own without a clinician defining it for us. Yes? Um, around the world, what is the, the uh, reimbursement? Thank you. Uh, what's the reimbursement environment around the world? So we know, for example, in the U.S., hardly any obesity treatments are covered by, by insurance except for gastric bypass surgeries. Uh, what's, the, what's the situation outside external, given uh, the severity of the obesity problem? Yeah, hard and getting harder. <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're obviously moving into and very much already in an era of, of evidence-based medicine. And certainly there are examples of therapies that have come to market over the years that ne weren't necessarily backed by uh, strong clinical data um, uh, or strong even outco economic outcomes data. Um, and over time, therapies that didn't hold muster have sort of been weeded out. Um, clearly, um, whether you're the FDA or any other regulatory body around the world, and then also obviously the, uh, the payers, uh, whether it's government payers or private insurance companies, um, all are becoming more and more demanding. And so we're actually we're actually upping our game and increasing our investment to do far more pre-market clinical research um, and even economic outcome studies. In fact, we've created a new organization within Medtronic called MCRI, Medtronic Clinical Research Institute, where we're deploying a number of strategies across the enterprise um, to not only um, leverage um, the expertise we have in terms of doing trials, but also to create post-market networks. So in addition to pre-market work, there's going to be a big, um, there's going to be a big component of post-market registries as well that'll come, that'll be conditions of approval in many parts of the world, whether those are, whether it's the US FDA, 
and CMS or whether that's um, the uh, health the technology authorities um, uh, assessment, health technology assessment organizations and other markets around the world, the HTAs. And so it, it, it is a competence of the company, it has to be more so. And it's just, you know, it's simple. And the, the panel this morning re, um, referred to it, the, um, uh, the insurance executive um, that was here said, hey, you know, um, prove it. Prove it, prove it works, prove it's cost effective. And that's a challenge that we're, we think is perfectly fair because it should, it should be cost effective. Yes? Do you see much potential for um, enhanced patient self-management tools like uh, devices to simply monitor uh, calorie intake and energy expenditure, create a budget for uh, patients to sort of guide them in the moment of making their choices? No, I, I definitely do, and, and you know, I had the opportunity to, to manage our diabetes franchise for three years uh, before my current position, and the, the real, my real takeaway from that was you know, diabetes is very different um, than a lot of the other Medtronic therapies, and in many of the other Medtronic therapies, it's, you know, the intervention is designed to kind of separate you from your disease. Okay, I fix your coronary vessel, I fix your, your uh, sinus node problem in your heart, and go back to your full life. In, in diabetes, the therapy that we have actually brings one closer to their disease. It puts the management more intensively in their own hands um, to literally uh, modulate the uh, programming of their own pump um, and, and take more control. And, and we want to surround that and see great value in the, in the system and other innovators surrounding that with other tools to do exactly what you mentioned. And that's, I think, the principle that that smart device I showed is all about, is it's a tool for a patient to not only help modify their behavior, but also to collect information that can help them sort of close the loop in their own mind. And, and um, you know, that's what it's all about. It's, you know, um, as these modalities get, get proven out and they're, they're safe and they're, they're less in invasive and they're, they're having a sustainable impact on behavior, I mean, that's going to be where the sweet spot is and that's where, you know, great innovators can make a difference. Yes? Um, sorry about that. Uh, you mentioned briefly Yeah, anybody from FDA in the room? <laughs> now, look, um, yeah, I, I want to make sure, you know, I'm balanced. And obviously, it's, it's pretty painful for a lot of people right now, probably even less painful for Medtronic, to be honest, than a lot of smaller companies. I tell you what I'm most afraid of with FDA, and, I mean, this bar that's just going so high um, is, um, you know, smaller, more innovative companies and the resources it's going to take to actually get through the FDA and in, in what's almost become an arbitrary process. Um, there's new leadership at FDA. There's an unmistakable message that they have a role to play in terms of containing healthcare costs. And one way they want to contain healthcare costs is to set a higher bar. So there's a lot of examples where we've done trials, other people have done trials that were agreed to several years ago by the FDA. They've completed the trials, they've been successful. They go to their review and the FDA comes back and says, oops, sorry, you had a bad protocol. Well, you approved it. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we're, we're dealing through some of that. Um, that being said, I'm actually grateful at some level for what FDA is doing, um, uh, you know, within, within balance. Um, you know, certainly there are many examples of products in the, in the 510K category, and a 510K clearance is a, is, a, is a very fast regulatory pathway for a product that's substantially equivalent to something else. Um, but there have been so many liberties taken with that over the years that the tide is to equivalence it may have been a predicate device from many, many years ago that's completely different. And as a result, there have been too many products in medical devices that have come on the market that have not provided a substantive improvement. And, and I think that as new technology comes on the market, it should be better. It should have demonstrably better outcomes um, and hopefully more value for the healthcare system than something that came before. Um, you know, we see this in the spine business um, where there are 150 different companies out there that have a cervical plate, an anterior cervical plate for um, anterior cervical disc fusion. The, the world doesn't need 150 cervical plates with no differentiation uh, among so many of them coming in. And so I think the idea of more rigor around the approval process for, um, for technology will set the bar a little higher, but it has to be within reason. We have to have a productive working relationship with FDA where good clinical evidence does rule the day 
at the end of the day, and there's not an arbitrariness about the system, which is what we're seeing a little bit. So, um, you know, I think we'll find that happy medium, and you know, obviously, you know, the, the biggest thing I worry about from from an FDA standpoint, and the, what we often try to kind of point out to them is there's other markets around the world that where where citizens are benefiting from technology. The the Veo pump example that I gave earlier is a classic example. This product saves lives. This product is safer than a regular insulin pump that doesn't automatically suspend glucose. Um, and it's and you know the, the pathway we're going to have to go through now is very difficult. Um, and so you know we're happy to do it. We're, we are going to do it. We're going to invest. And Medtronic has a, certainly a wherewithal to kind of endure through that process more than a lot of companies, which you know is fortunate for us. But it's not um, necessarily um, um, you know it's not kind of worked out completely how that's going to how that's going to work. But it all comes down to good evidence, good you know safety, efficacy, and cost effectiveness, and that's what we're focused on. Maybe one, one more question. Sorry. in a more quality way. Do you have any collaborative studies or uh, any collaborations with other pharmaceutical firms or other um, institutions, maybe scientific institutions, to find a better way how to deliver insulin to the diabetes patients? Um, yes. Yes. In fact, we have a wonderful collaboration with the Eli Lilly Company. Um, and I know Thane is going to come up here and talk. And I've had a chance to work with him uh, in the past on this. And, um, you know, we have a marketing collaboration with Eli Lilly, but over the years we've, we've looked at different types of insulin, um, pump insulin. Um, you know, there, are, there are some doctors who use more concentrated forms of insulin in pumps, especially for type 2 diabetes who have a higher insulin requirement. Um, and we obviously closely follow you know, a lot of the developments. Um, you know, we continue to look at technologies like pre-filled insulin cartridges, which would make use of the product far more uh, efficient and um, and easy for the patient, um, and you know while some of these projects have kind of started and stopped over the years, uh, Eli Lilly's been a, just a great partner for us, and um, you know we we collaborate in a number of areas with them, for example. But in our broader drug delivery strategy, um, you know we have some great assets. We have implantable pumps um, for for neuro um, application. We have an implantable insulin pump. At, which is really a research tool um, primarily used overseas. And we have external pumps. We're developing a patch pump to be worn on the skin. And so, you know, the, the, the challenge with so many drugs, especially new drugs, is how do you actually create site-specific delivery technologies to get the right drug to the right place and the right dose at the right time. And we see that as a whole new field uh, for Medtronic in treating degenerative disease, particularly neurodegenerative disorders, where you're trying to get a protein or a um, difficult to deliver molecule to a certain place in the brain or in the in the body. And so we have collaborations with other pharmaceutical companies as well, um, including for diseases like Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease, and we even have some early stage research in, in Alzheimer's. Um, so, you know, we're very interested in that and on the, certainly on the diabetes side, Lilly is our, uh, our partner. I think I'm getting the hook, so. <laughs> Uh, thank Chris again for his time. Very well. Thank you. Uh, Sign basketball from Coach K, uh, Duke basketball coach. So we hope. Sign basketball from. Oh my God! Wow. I, my boss is going to be jealous. Yeah, right. Bill exactly. Hawkins. Don't yeah. Don't let uh, Bill in the office to steal that. That is that's <laughs> phenomenal. Well, um, thanks to all of you. You know, I I want to give all of you kudos for having this conference and raising these issues. And as you know from all these panels and discussions, these are they're not easy answers, but. You know, we, we kind of pull together as a community and work together. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna solve some very difficult uh, problems. So look forward to it. Thanks very much. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.